This week on The Communicators, a discussion about the future of interactive television with Dan Simpkins, the CEO of Hillcrest Labs, located in the Washington, D.C. area. Hillcrest Labs is at the, in the D.C. metro area. Its CEO is Dan Simpkins, and their company concentrates on interactive technology for cable TV and other products. Also joining us this week on The Communicators, Mike Fiesel. He's the executive editor of Communications Daily. He's serving as our guest host for this, uh, out for this half hour. To both of you, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Simpkins, how would you describe the philosophy of your company, especially when, with the interactive TV phase of it? Uh, you know, our goal when we set out to build the company, um, Pedro, was to reinvent how consumers navigated um, digital content on the television. You know, as all content goes uh, to digital form, content's exploding. I mean, think about it. We're bombarded with content every day um, and all forms of content. And consumers need a better way to find that content um, and enjoy interacting with that content. As, as younger and younger um, you know, consumers get access to more and more technology, they want to be part of the experience. And uh, I don't think they, they really want to be locked into just what we want to deliver to them. They want to be in control. And so our philosophy was to create an interactive platform um, that would make it easier to navigate content and, um, and for consumers to be part of the interactive experience. Now, a good way to think about that, a really good analogy, is uh, think back 20 years or more when Jobs put a mouse on the PC and coupled it to this rich graphical environment. And really what that did was ignite a revolution in the computer. It took the computer from being a scientific tool to being a consumer tool. We're doing the same thing for television. Mike Fiesel. But, but, you know, other than losing my, my remote all the time, why do I need a new remote? How does this differ? Well, it, it differs in, in many ways. And there are really two things that I think, um, Mike, you want to focus on. The first is that what we set out to do is, is transform the remote, is to make it simpler. So today's remotes have 50 buttons. And frankly, you know, we call them mechanical operating systems. You know, uh, the operating system is the device that, that controls the environment. And every time you want to add a new feature, you add a new button. Um, and with the explosion in content, we just don't think that scales. We don't think the up, down, left, right remote scales. So our objective, you know, first is to simplify the remote. And second is to integrate, is to consolidate the functions into one operating environment, one application environment, that, so that one remote controls the entire experience. So our, our goal is, as, this, as we emerge um, into this new generation of, te of television, is that um, the functions will simplify um, on the remote, and the number of devices will reduce. Explain just a little bit about how it works. Um, uh, Certainly. Uh, if you think about um, television today, um, you would like to select a channel. So you pick up your remote control, and uh, you might choose a channel by going up, 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 or down, down, down. Um, if you have a program guide, an electronic program guide that is typical for cable operators, you'd, um, you, know, you could go up, down, uh, right, and left. And the interesting, if you think about that, um, at any given point that uh, the consumer is sitting at, you have four choices. You can go up, down, right, or left. Um, in the future, and, and, and look at the PC, today when you have a mouse, you have the entire screen. So rather than four choices, you have an unlimited number of choices. Frankly, only limited by the computer scientist's imagination and ability to create application. So what we set out to do was bring that same type of flexibility to the screen, a graphical environment and a mouse that would control that environment. So the way it works is that when you turn on the TV, instead of getting a typical program guide that just allows you to go up, down, left, right, you get this, um, you get a desk, almost like a desktop. You get an, a, a world, an integrated world, that has many applications all controlled by the mouse. So there's a cursor on screen. It's controlled by a device. And that cursor lets you choose objects um, in very flexible way and then lets you manipulate the applications in a very flexible way. So um, there's, the way we think about it is all heads up. No longer do you have to look at your remote control to figure out what to do. It's all about looking at the screen. So you probably could step in and say, here's a prototype of what you're talking about, and it's shaped like a ring. Tell a little bit about the design of why you chose it that way, and how does it operate? So the loop, which you're holding right now, and you're, um, 
in your hand is essentially a mouse for television. So if you could show uh, the audience, you'll see that there are two buttons um, and, a, and a wheel. So much like a mouse today has a, le a left mouse button and a right mouse button and a wheel, this device is similar. Now it controls, so as you're picking it up, uh, think about uh, the Wii. So the Wii is, is now a game platform that uses interactivity. So with this device, we pick it up, we wave it around, and we control a cursor on screen in air. So we call that technology free space. It's, it uses it freely in space. The consumer uses it in, in the free space. And, um, and so we, we move a cursor, we find choices, we click with the button, we then zoom. We, so we have a spatial interface, what's called like a map. You know, when, you, when you're using Google Maps, and you want to get closer and closer or deeper and deeper, you'll zoom in. So that device allows you to zoom in on content, zoom out, make a choice, and then consume the content. So it's a little tricky to explain without uh, seeing the graphical environment, um, but really think about uh, that this is a device that controls the applications on screen. Now is this designed for cable, for satellite, for broadcast TV, for what? Um, you know, uh, it's interesting. There was one topic that Pedro uh, brought up earlier um, which is why is it a, a ring? And, um, and one of the reasons why is this is this is an icon. It, it's an I, we call this a concept car. It's an iconic shape. The idea of the ring is that it's a whole. We're controlling the whole experience. So what we set out to do when we built uh, this platform is to enable you to control any of those environments. Hillcrest builds an application environment, an application development environment for television. So anyone who makes a box that connects to the television and anyone who wants to put content on the television um, can use our software to create better ways to navigate that content and um, manipulate it and help consumers interact with it. How's cable responding to this concept? So the cable industry um, historic, the ca cable, satellite, telcos are all responding very favorably. Um, technology like this is disruptive. It really is changing the way consumers interact. And in any disruptive technology, you find that those companies that are typically um, addressing the mass market, they need to see that the technology is proven and they, they have to be comfortable with the technology before they're willing to put it um, in the hands of millions of consumers. Um, we are working very closely with cable, with the, the telephone companies, with IPTV, um, and also with consumer electronics companies to find that, er, that first application, that first place where the, the loop and home, um, which is our software um, brand, the software environment, would fit best. Um, we're talking very extensively with cable to uh, figure that out and uh, we're hoping that um, in the not too distant future there'll be applications that leverage the software. Is this a good environment to introduce something like this? It's a very competitive environment, cables competing with TV, with telcos and with DBS and all these kind of things. Everybody trying to distinguish themselves. You know, it's uh, that's an excellent question because it's the perfect environment. Anytime you have a lot of competition, you need to differentiate yourselves. And we set out when we built this platform is to create something that would be highly distinct, but also let those operators monetize the assets that they, um, they need to bring to the consumer in the most effective way. And so this platform is ideal for that. Do you have to uh, get regulation from the FCC or approval for this device? No, we don't. Um, the, the, the cable operators are now moving in the direction of creating open platforms. A, a good initiative that has recently uh, come out is True Two Way. So True Two Way is a is a branded evolution of a platform called Open Cable, and and this is compatible with. That. Um, and this is our environment. Um, that's actually something that we're talking with the cable operators about: is how do we create compatibility? Uh, True Two Way still anticipated an up down left right remote. So we have a little work to get um, the True 2A environment to support a pointer-based interface. And we're spending a lot of time with cable labs um, and with the cable operators, the leading cable operators, to develop ways that they can um, step into this future. But that's an RF-based device, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, do you need licensing for that? Yes. Yeah, so the FCC um, is uh, always in... Um, always asking companies that do RF technologies to get official licenses. So you have to register your radio 
um, and you, you obviously have to get approval for that. That isn't the center point of our technology. We use fairly standard um, RF technologies. We, um, we use frequencies that are similar to Wi-Fi, what you use at home in your home networks. Um, so we, have, uh, we, we currently have gone through that FCC um, process, and we don't anticipate a problem with the, uh, with the registration. But the process. anticipation comes in interfering with other devices? Uh, when it comes to radios, always um, there, are, there are two concerns. Um, one is obviously that, um, that things will interfere with you, which isn't as much of a concern to the FCC, but it's a concern to the designer, to the engineer. And the, uh, the FCC's principal concern is that you will interfere with important um, radio communications. And so there are specific bands uh, that, are, that you have to operate in and specific regulations on the, the power level um, and the way the spectrum looks. And, um, and this is fairly uh, routine technology um, for developers today. So uh, that, isn't, uh, that isn't an area that we have put the, the bulk of our focus. One of the great things that you suggest is unifying all the, all the different things that I might put on my TV, my, the Internet streaming, the, my home libraries, other people's uh, content, that sort of thing. How does it get on the, the TV in the first place, though? Have you, have you found a way to make that easy for an old guy like me to do that? I think um, it's, it's interesting because that goes back to this previous question. We were talking about the FCC um, and FCC regulations with regard to the radio. What's really more interesting in the FCC is, is um, the initiatives of the FCC is pursuing um, to encourage um, competition and innovation in television. And so uh, today, of course, the FCC has gone out of their way to encourage um, to make it easier for competitive carriers to come into jurisdictions. Um, recently there were uh, some rulings that made it easier for telcos to bring television into jurisdictions where cable existed. Um, and also the FCC has been working very aggressively to open up competition with True Two Way, with, with OCAP. So um, the FCC obviously is, an, is worried about devices, but is also worried about the industry at large. And so when you go to this, when you, when you actually turn the tables to how do you get it, clearly um, television is changing and evolving. And that push for competition that the FCC you know, has, has encouraged is opening up other avenues to get video content to the, the television. And I think that's really exciting. We're seeing the web as a very um, powerful tool to bring video content into uh, into the living room. And of course we see telcos with IPTV as very compelling new ways to bring content into the living room. And what we're going to see going forward and why this device was round, so the talk about unification, is that the consumer wants to get access to all of this technology in easy way and not worry about where it comes from. You really don't want to go to your PC, do you, and get YouTube videos. You don't want to have to go to your TV and think about the difference between over-the-air ATSC um, broadcast as well as cable or telcos um, interacting with the web. So part of what our software platform was intended to do, Mike, was to create a unified navigation environment so that the consumer really doesn't have to think about the sources. That those sources come in through an IP infrastructure, the, the language of the internet, um, and get harmonized in a device, which might be a set-top, it might be the television itself, um, it could um, even be a PC uh, or a consumer electronics box like the TiVo. So a device that connects to the TV brings all of that content in and one software environment harmonizes it with one device to control it. So You mentioned the set-top. There's a discussion going on about what's going to happen with the set-top over the next few years. Does that affect this technology? Any platform that has a computer, essentially a processor in it, that connects to the internet on one side and television on the other is a target for our software. So as the PC set-top and television evolve over the next you know, five years, we're going to um, see a, a wide breadth of, of technologies available that could bring this technology in and, and make it simpler for consumers to to interoperate with television, to interact with television. Let's actually frame this a little bit differently. What are we trying to do here? Free space is an, a way to interact with the television in a way that's vastly simpler than the, 
typical remote control. So we're hoping that free space um, and the way we're seeing um, the, uh, the reaction to free space, um, we, we feel that this, we're very confident in this, free space will be the new technology um, for interaction, much like the mouse became the new way to control a PC. Home, the software environment, um, is an open um, application platform that will allow all sorts of nifty applications to be created, ways to bring internet video in, bring personal photos and music all together with your broadcast television um, or uh, content um, or user-generated content, um, allow you to communicate with friends and family in that s same world. So the idea is to take free space and home, place that on a platform, and create a revolution in television. So I'm hearing you correctly, keeping a set-top would advance those causes for your business. Keeping a device that can adequately connect the internet and um, traditional sources of video, um, the cable plant or the telco plant, um, connected to the television, um, those are the type of platforms that would advance our cause. Um, Set-tops are today the leading way that consumers consume television. Um, Seventy plus million households have set-top boxes, um, you know, connected to cable, um, plus you know, another number connected to satellite set-tops. So a set-top is a good way to, to get video content into the television. They won't, set-tops are now um, seeing a real uh, revolution. Uh, frankly, um, a nice, uh, there's a nice transition in the set-top world because of, again, competition. The FCC has encouraged, uh, you know, open competition in set-tops. We're seeing new companies bring set-tops to the, to the market. So we think the set-top is an ideal platform for us. It's not the only platform, but it's a good one. Mike Fiesel? You've mentioned a couple of times the revolution in TV, and I'm mild mildly curious about what effect this revolution has on the established networks. If I'm spending more time watching web-based TV or my own videos or that sort of thing. I think today... Um, what consumers want is to find the best content and consume it. What you will find with technology like this and other technologies that make it easier to control the television experience, um, the DVR was an excellent example of that, is that consumers are going to demand better, better programming. Um, they're going to raise the bar for the networks. I know, um, frankly, a rising tide floats all boats, and we're pretty excited because as more and more people um, are able to integrate the web experience and the television experience, it frankly will give the networks opportunities to distribute their content in broader ways, in more interesting ways. So I particularly don't think that it um, will have a negative impact. This kind of technology, frankly, I think will have a positive impact. If they're afraid of a negative impact, though, does this delay make it more difficult for you to sell your product to them? It's been around a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, the so selling the technology uh, really comes from a, a lot, there are a lot of ways to answer that, um, the selling process. Um, you talk about us being around for a few years. Frankly, this is a very hard technology to create. Um, it's not something that you just wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to create um, this, this interactive platform. So uh, we are now at the point where this technology is mature. Um, we are very excited because uh, we now have a reference platform, which we call the Home Reference Kit. Um, that makes it very easy for our customers to take this technology and try it and build applications. Um, the, uh, the networks aren't the direct beneficiaries of this technology initially. Um, our first customers will be consumer electronics companies that will leverage uh, this, um, uh, this platform, this new user interface for television, to bring new applications uh, to the television. And once that technology, this technology is proven, uh, to work for mass markets, I think you're going to see in it um, really a, a significant migration toward this technology. And in order to get that to work, you're going to have to change how the consumer relates to the television as far as a remote device. What are your plans for doing that? Well, let's go back to the PC. Um, and frankly, we can think about many different technologies that come, come to the market. So imagine you just got a new device. It's a PC. You're, currently, you're used to typing on a keyboard and used to using up, down, left, right arrows to control a cursor on screen. And suddenly somebody br brings a mouse uh, to you and says, this is the wave of the future. It took a full 10 years before the mouse became a really a completely um, um, 
penetrated device in the consumer's um, world. Um, frankly, users, you know, once we hit the 95 time frame, no one was going to ask for a PC that had DOS, you know, that, that had arrow keys. Every, Windows 95. Windows 95. So we would think that um, at that point, consumers had fully adopted this technology. So it does take time to adopt technology. So the way you do it um, is you penetrate in a small and a niche market, you find an ideal application for that technology, and then you grow from there. You expand out into um, other markets. And so that's the approach that we're taking. Um, we first brought this technology, the free space technology, into the market through a partnership with Logitech, which is the leading mouse company. So it's very logical. We're making a mouse for the living room. So Logitech, the, um, the mouse company, uh, adopted free space and brought it into um, their, their platform. And uh, they created a, um, a mouse they call the MX Air, which lets a consumer use it on the desk and then pick it up and use it in air. And that, um, that gets consumers to start thinking about how a three-dimensional product works. Now, one of the big booms for this industry was, um, for us and for the industry in general, was Nintendo's Wii. Wii uses motion to um, improve the gaming experience and uses pointing to control their environment. And so we're excited because they have created now a sense in the marketplace for that, that type of technology. They, they are creating awareness for us. So we think our job is actually going to be easier. Um, and frankly, since the Wii came out, people have now um, uh, flocked to us and asked us how our technology might enable them to create pointing-based applications. One of the key questions on the, on the success of this is how much it costs. How much does it cost bar a, for the, the loop, for the software that, that you have to put into a box, and all the back office stuff that goes with it? So Hillcrest is a, um, our business model is that we supply technology to other companies. Um, so much like Intel supplies microprocessors to computer companies, we supply free space sensors and the home software environment to other companies. We don't control the cost. Um, but suffice to say that um, this device is similar to a wireless mouse, so the loop that you were showing is, is like a, a wireless mouse. This, the Logitech device is a wireless mouse. And um, we are... Um, well, what and, does it cost to make that? So the, the cost of that device at retail is about $149. Okay. The cost of platforms that will use our technology will be similar to set-top boxes. They will be um, in the $199, $299, $399 price range. The cost of our technology really depends on how it's used. And so the specific cost overall of a consumer product, typically the cost of the materials for a consumer product is about a quarter of the retail price. So if you have a device that costs $160, the cost of the materials and all the technology in it is about $40. Um, so in, um, in these products, we're talking about retail consumer products in the $199, $299 range. The cost of the technology is substantially less than the $40 or $50, that um, the overall product. That includes the manuals and the box and the, the cables and everything. So um, we're talking about um, costs that are uh, less than $10 typically. How did you get to the idea to do this? What's, what's the background that gets you here? Uh, the, um, I have been an entrepreneur for the, the bulk of my career. Um, my grandparents were immigrants. They were entrepreneurs. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur, and early on, um, he ran a retail business, and uh, when I was in high school, I worked for him and really got the bug to, to start companies. I um, had an opportunity through, um, through some serendipity in 1990 to form my last company called Salix. Um, I ran Salix for 10 years. And what did they do? Um, Salix was a pioneer in Internet telephony, so we're we now know Skype and Vonage. These are companies that allow you to send voice um, calls over the internet. Um, Salix was one of the pioneers in that early technology. So uh, Salix I built up over a, a 10 year period and uh, was very lucky and successful um, to be able to leverage the telecom um, growth that occurred in the late 90s and sold that company in 1990 to a company called Telabs. Uh, that, was, um, that was a successful venture transaction and um, after that, I actually had planned to take a couple of years off and frankly write a book called The Ten Laws of the Entrepreneur. 
And um, my management team, when the bubble collapsed, my management team approached me and said, would you start another company? And reluctantly, after they twisted my arm a little bit, um, reluctantly, I said, let's do it, but let's do something different. Let's not do Son of Salix and just evolve the same idea, because obviously the telecom industry had, um, had really come to somewhat of a standstill at that time. So we decided to look at the trends in the industry and identify a new direction to go in, and, and we came up with the idea for Hillcrest. Because of the economic times, do you find your venture capitalists staying with you, especially since you're still developing a product that still needs to be marketed to people so they can understand it? You know, in the, you open up the whole topic of the venture capital and the venture capital world, and I think that's, that's an interesting uh, topic to talk about. Um, within the context of what is going on in, in the economic landscape. Um, there was just an article that um, w was you know, just published today that said that um, the last quarter was the first quarter in literally 30 years that a venture-backed startup did not have an IPO. So it is a tough time for um, venture-backed companies. And what you're seeing is flight to quality. Venture capitalists um, back companies, and they back the best companies and as times get tough what's interesting is that you find the the investors the best investors look for the best companies um, and and frankly su then support those through thick and thin um, I am really fortunate I have um, four venture investors today three are based in the Washington area which is exciting um, NEA New Enterprise Associates um, in um, Chevy Chase Grotech Capital and Columbia Capital, all our investors, and my fourth investor, Alliance Bernstein, is based in New York. I have very, very high quality investors, and those investors recognize that building companies is a very tough thing. You don't just wake up one day and, um, you know, in the bubble, 15 minutes later, sell your company for a million dollars and, and uh, ride off into the sunset. Uh, company building is a complex, difficult, sophisticated um, proposition that requires people to understand it. Um, and, ven and the best venture capitalists understand it very well. Why did you end up being here in the D.C. area? You're, you're not from here. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm from New York. Um, I uh, was recruited out of college. I went to Cornell. Um, and uh, a small uh, think tank in Arlington um, recruited me on campus, and I came to the Washington area. And um, really, I've, over the last almost 30 years, have made Washington my home. I think Washington is very exciting from a number of uh, perspectives. One is there's an extraordinary amount of talent. The government laboratories, as well as um, the government agencies, the FCC we talked about earlier, um, is really a, a critical magnet for technologists to come to this area. And the area has been, um, you know, has been the home to many very innovative companies. Um, and once those companies grow up and succeed, um, entrepreneurs within those companies leave and form new enterprises. Um, there's an enormous amount of talent um, that's really outside the Beltway, um, you know, outside the thick of, of the government world, and that talent is creating new companies, new ideas every day. Um, we were home to AOL, which of course was really a, a pioneer in, in the Internet, to UUNet, um, to XM Radio, um, as well as many media uh, companies, Discovery, um, you know, BET. So there's, there's a, a lot of both media and, um, and technology in this area. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I've, I've made it my home, and I think it's a really great place to create companies. And being in Washington, do you think that legislators, regulators, the FCC get what you guys do? And if that's the case, how can they, what, what message would you have for them over the next five years? You know, one of the benefits of me being in Washington is I can actually leverage legislation. And we talked about earlier some of the regulatory issues. I think legislation is as much a, as, as, as critical to companies like mine as regulation. Um, I have the opportunity to spend time with, um, with my legislators. I've been in a position to look at some of the critical topics and help educate them. And I think entrepreneurs and, um, and executives in business have an obligation to do that. And I think there are two critical areas that um, we're facing right now that affect me, patent reform and patent legislation, as well as immigration. I think you hear that every day. Um, but if I was going to encourage my, the legislators to really um, focus on critical topics, it's making sure that we have a continued supply of talent through uh, the reformation and appropriate use of, of, of immigration laws to encourage new talent to, to come here and stay here. 
um, and then also in the patent domain. Clearly, innovation um, is a critical part of the engine of America. And if we don't have small businesses, which of course are a leading engine for economic development to continue to be able to innovate, we're not going to be, um, we just won't have the economic future we, we are expecting. We are out of time. Our guest has been Dan Simpkins of Hillcrest, La Hillcrest Lab, serves as their CEO. Also our guest host for this edition of The Communicators, Mike Fiesel of Communications Daily. To both of you, thanks for joining us.